Hi folks, Dave here. XC and Y sent me two of their latest battery models. This is a 280 amp hour version and a 310 amp hour version. I've reviewed their batteries before and I was quite impressed, so I chose to accept these. I did not expect to get the 280 and the 300. I thought I would get one of the 300 amp hour models. Both of them have the low temp protection built in. It says it right on the case. And they're a compact design. You can see they're not tiny, but they're not as big as what I would expect a 300 amp hour battery to be. So these are newer, more energy dense lithium iron phosphate cells. What I do like about XC and Y is they first show you the email address for service. They tell you you get a three year free replacement. If you experience any quality issues within three years, you can contact us to obtain a new battery. Now that's the kind of straightforward behavior that I like. That's the way customers ought to be treated. And I must say that does impress me. In my opinion, there's a lot of batteries on the market and it's not so much the battery itself. It's the service, it's the support, it's the warranty that's gonna be the distinguishing factor. Now, the only way to verify that these batteries have the 280 amp hour and 310 amp hour is to do a deep cycle test. That means to charge them all the way up to full voltage and then run them all the way down and see how many amp hours are in them. And I usually do that in my reviews. So I'm gonna go ahead and start working on that now. That's quite a process with uh, over six kilowatts of storage. It's gonna take a long, long time to do that test. Just got these out of the box. I wanna make sure that they're at least holding a charge. If you get a battery like this and it's down in like the Levens, I would uh, send it back right away. But these batteries are no problem at all, 13.17 volts. So it turns out this battery is so new that there's no information available on the internet about it. And the specifications are not publicly available. So I'll have to use what's in the manual. Now the 280 and the 310 are physically the same thing in terms of size and volume. They have the same dimensions. So about seven and a half inches by a little over 13 and a half by a little bit more than nine and a half inches high. The battery is claiming to have grade A LifePo 4 cells. So hopefully they're just really good quality. They come through factories in the millions. So uh, my main concern is that they QA the cells before they put them in there. Tearing the battery apart and looking at the cells isn't really gonna change anything. The average person isn't gonna do that. What really matters is the rated capacity. So they sent me a 280 amp hour and a 310 amp hour version. Recommended charging current is 40 amps. That's reasonable. Uh, C10 would be 31 amps or 28 amps depending on which one. So 40 amps is pretty reasonable. You're not going to harm the battery with 40 amps. And the charging voltage according to manufacturer is over 14 volts. Personally I don't charge my batteries like that but for the purposes of these reviews I just follow whatever's in the manual. Generally speaking I never want to run down to 10 volts but if necessary in order to do a review and a test I will run it down to 10 volts to see if it gets the rated capacity. If it meets the rated capacity then I don't run it down any farther. I always like to see a couple extra amp hour, that way I can avoid running it down to 10 volts or 11 volts. The 280 and 310 amp hour batteries have a 200 amp BMS. This means you should be able to pull 200 amps of current from that battery, but that's really hard on the battery so I wouldn't do it for a long time. Peak discharge current is claimed to be 500 amps for 3 to 5 seconds. Uh, again, I wouldn't do that if you can avoid it, that's almost like using it for a starter battery. And in the manual specifically says don't use the battery for a starter battery. It's just not designed for that. It's for a storage application only. Now the batteries do have low temp discharging protection. It's okay to discharge a lithium iron phosphate battery when it's near freezing, but I would never ever charge them and you should not even risk it because it would destroy the battery. It's nice that they put this low temp charging protection in there, but I would advise everybody who's in low temperatures to do something to protect your batteries other than relying on a BMS. This should be your last line of defense. So very nice that XD and Y has this low temp charging protection in there. Not all batteries have it as well as this low temp discharging protection. Now the battery does have short circuit protection, which is basically akin to overcurrent protection. A short circuit's probably gonna be in the hundreds and hundreds of amps, and that would mean the battery would just turn off. Overcurrent means that it will allow some high current for a short time, but then it will turn off. Both of these are kind of the same thing. They're kind of related. It's just a matter of time. The timing between the two is very short. It's just measured in seconds, probably. Now the manufacturer recommends these set points for your charge controller. Personally, I use completely different numbers, but anyway, they're in the manual. This is what most people use, and maybe in the future I'll do a video on how I charge my lithium iron phosphate batteries. But for the purposes of this review, I'm just following their set points, whatever they say to set your charge controller to, that's, that's what I do. And they have some really nice information in the manual. They took the time to show different types of connections, and for people who are new to batteries and new to solar power, something like this actually can be very useful. Uh, as a creator of technical documentation myself, uh, in the professional sense, uh, I know how much effort it takes to create documentation like this, and I'm impressed that they took the time to put that in there. And here they're just talking about their service. As long as they honor, you know, their 
SLA here for their support and everything. I mean, I really don't have any complaints with that. I think that's very impressive. Well, I'm going to go ahead and run this test. I'm going to include the fact that my workshop is 64 degrees Fahrenheit, which is rather on the chilly side. And we're also going to talk about how much heat, actual heat, is in a battery and how do you quantify that in terms of electricity. Okay, the XCNY 310 amp hour sample is fully charged, and I mean it is absolutely jam-packed full of power. So it's time to do the discharge test. There is no charge controller connected. The solar charge controller is disconnected, so this battery is completely by itself, and it's connected to my inverter. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on the inverter. Okay, the inverter's on, and I've plugged in my electric space heater. It's a Harbor Freight infrared heater. I'm going to show you that. It's a parabolic heater. I'm actually quite fond of this type of heater. I have several of them. And we're going to go ahead and do the test with this heater. Let's go ahead and turn it on. Alright, it's on. Lots of heat coming out. I can feel it. And let's go over here. So I'm currently getting about 660 watts of heat from the system. I already took out 9 amp hour and the voltage is still well over 13 volts so that's very impressive however at the end of the day all that matters is how the battery actually performs and that's why i do a real world test like this to see what really happens here's a quick in the middle update at 80 percent 247 amp hours remaining according to this battery computer here still holding 13.11 volts over 640 watts and the heater is running just fine and i'll cut in towards the end of the test hopefully i can catch the last amp hour going out of this battery we'll see So let's just see how much this heater heats up this workshop. I'm going to include the fact that my workshop is 64 degrees Fahrenheit, which is rather on the chilly side. The walls are not all insulated. Those walls there are not insulated. The main building walls where it touches those walls have foam board insulation. And the ceiling is well insulated, although you can't see it. It's on the other side of the ceiling there. And I'm just going to do this as part of the experiment. I'm going to talk a little bit about heat and how much heat is in a typical battery. How do you calculate that? What do you compare it to? So what is heat and how do we quantify or measure it? Well, heat is typically measured and quantified in terms of BTUs per hour or British thermal units per hour. And without getting too technical, it's just a way of mathematically measuring and quantifying heat over a variety of circumstances. What I like to do is compare common heat sources to each other and use that to compare to other heat sources such as solar electric and battery based. Let's take the iconic 20 pound propane tank for example. Pretty much everybody has seen these and probably has first hand experience using them and has some knowledge of how much heat is in them. And in short, the amount of heat in these tanks is well a lot. It's a lot of heat. A typical propane tank like this would be expected to have 20 pounds of propane in it, although it is a little bit variable because you never can say exactly how much is in it. But assuming this tank has 20 pounds of propane, a single pound of propane has 21,600 BTUs of heat, and if it's full and it really has 20 pounds in it, it's going to have over 430,000 BTUs of heat inside that could potentially be released to heat a space. And that's over 120 kilowatt hours of heat that could be released from this tank if you want to measure it in terms of electrical uh, power or wattage. Now wattage is one to one for heat so if you have 100 watts of electrical energy coming in then you can potentially have 100 watts of electrical energy available to use in your space that you're heating. Of course this isn't taking into account other factors such as having a heat pump which is able to produce more heat than the amount of wattage that is input into the system. We're just talking about straight direct electric resistance heat in this case. 100 watt hours can be converted to about 341 British thermal units or BTUs per hour. A heater like what you're seeing here, this Harbor Freight infrared parabolic heater, is putting out about 2100 BTUs of heat and that's coming from a battery. So if I took both of these XC and Y batteries, one is 280 amp hours, the other is 310, and I put them in parallel and I charge them all the way up, then the amount of BTUs that's stored in them is 25,700 BTUs, but that's without a heat pump. If you had a heat pump, you might be getting 50 to 75,000 BTUs of heat. So you can see that the comparison between two fairly large batteries and a propane tank isn't even close in terms of the capacity to hold heat. If you look at the fact that these batteries can be recharged over and over again for many years to come, then it starts to look a whole lot better. 
Because this 20 pound propane tank isn't really renewable and you cannot recharge it on your own without depending on a very large developed infrastructure. Now perhaps the same could be said about the entire grid, the entire system that develops solar panels and manufactures them in large factories. However, there's a certain amount of freedom and independence you get from solar panels that you will never get from a propane tank because it's requiring a huge factory and a huge refinery and a huge development of infrastructure just to create that gas. So it's a huge top-heavy system that is not self-renewing. You can't renew it. But solar panels, you can put them out in your yard and you can fill those batteries over and over and over again. You can add more batteries, more solar panels, and you can independently develop uh, capture and store heat and use heat anytime you want to. So using batteries for supplemental heat makes actually a lot of sense if the batteries are big enough and they're not being run too hard in the process. The 310 amp hour battery raised the temperature in my shop to 72 degrees Fahrenheit after the test was completed. Towards the end of the test I reduced the output power to about 270 watts to slow things down and I was able to catch it on camera. The 310 amp hour XE and Y battery did pass the test. It has in excess of 310 amp hours in it. I don't need to run it down flat dead to extract another 2 or 3 amp hours. It's just not necessary. And not to be outdone, the 280 amp hour version of this battery also has in excess of its rated capacity. So no problem there. The fact that the battery has the rated capacity at the very least is what the customer cares about. And anyone who got a battery with 309 amp hours would not be happy. So the 310 amp hour absolutely has an excess of its rated capacity, and that's fantastic. Please note I don't get paid for testing these batteries, nor do I receive sales commissions. I'm sharing my feedback and opinion after the test. Based on the strong performance of these battery samples in my testing, I don't hesitate to recommend them. I do hope that XE and Y honors their support and warranty claims printed on the battery. And just to be clear, there's no honest and above board way that I can test their warranty or verify the claims. If you'd like to buy a set of these batteries, the product links are posted in the description. Thanks to XNY for sending a pair of their batteries for testing. I hope this video helps you out. Thanks for watching.